Well, church, you know this part well. Uh, You can remain seated. I'm going to read through it for time's sake because we've been here for too long in this portion of the book of Hebrews. But grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. And and we're in verses 17 to 19 right now. And um, Hebrews chapter 11 is affectionately known as the chapter of the lifestyles of the righteous and faithful. (laughs) These who loved God and followed God were these who trusted God. They put their faith in the Lord against all odds. That's why we love them. Every single one of us, and it's legendary, it's eternal, where we love reading the stories about and the accounts of events where the underdog won. David and Goliath, you name it. It's throughout the Bible where God does his work the greatest with the fewest amount of people. God does his brightest work in the darkest of the hours. And if you're not careful, you'll get swallowed up either by the size of the enemy or by the darkness of the hour versus focusing on God. And this is true in every era. And every era until Christ returns, there's going to be that element of light and dark. There's going to be that that good and that evil. There's going to be uh, the right and the wrong. And that's going to ebb and flow in dynamics, leaning one way or the other, frankly, based upon how a people submits to God. And if we are submitted to God, that takes faith to submit to God. When God, listen, is yielded to, God moves. I protest this part about God. He's too much of a gentleman. Sometimes he's just too gentle. Because I I read what I know he can do, and I read what he wants to do, and then I get in the way of it all. And I don't want him to be such a gentleman. I want him to grab me by the ear and make me do his will. Because I know that if that happens, if his will happens, everything's going to turn out great. It's my thinking. It's my process. It's the way I see it that ruins things. And I'm telling you now that How We Live Our Lives with Christ is the title of this four-part series, and that is the history of faith. The history of faith is throughout the Bible. The history of faith is being lived out by you and I right now, and the history of faith is our future. So I'm going to ask you to just follow along. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac... And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This is Isaac. This is Abraham and Isaac. Verse 18, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed, your genealogy, your, uh, the children that follow and come from you shall be called. Concluded that God was able to raise him up, that is, raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from which he also received, that is, Abraham received him in a figurative sense. So we're going to end this portion of scripture tonight, but I hope we get a lot out of this short portion. And it is this, number one, always mark this down. Always remember that what we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 11 must always be uh, filtered through verse one. Look at verse one with your Bibles open. Hebrews 11 verse one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Just think about that for a moment. Secondly, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not some whimsical, strange, odd, ignorant practice by those who are out of touch with reality. It's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. Faith is an intelligent, faith is an educated, faith is a willful response to what you know by the evidence that God provides. That's the issue. When people say, I don't have faith, I don't want to have faith, they are ignoring the evidence. God does not, listen, God does not ask you to make a blind leap of faith. Wherever that came from, I don't know, but it's not from the Bible. God says, basically, open your eyes to study what you can see and what you can see. Can you unpack it? Can you just begin to dissect it? And guess what you'll find out? Friends, listen, listen up. This, I am paraphrasing the ancient Bible. 
unpack the physical things that you can see with your naked eye and you will discover that they are made up of things that are not seen by the naked eye. God is flirting with us in the realm of faith. Everything you and I see, we think, that's obvious, it's physical. When you see something physical, you've got to realize, right, we've beat this horse to death, I think, in our previous studies. What is physical in the world that you and I live in is what we see visibly. We think that's all there is to the physical nature of it. This podium, as I said before, or your life. If we were to suck all the moisture out of our bodies, we would be, a, we'd be like the size of an egg in an egg carton. This podium is made more up of space than actual physical see and touch. The world in its physics actually invites you to consider if you can experience things that are made by things that are not seen, then if that's true, what's on the other side of that? And on the other side of that is God. A universe, a world, an existence that is eternal. I want to put this up on the screen if it is a blessing to you. Real faith acts as an accelerant to ignite the mind and the heart toward discovery. I want you to think about that for a moment. Real faith, if it's real, it acts as an accelerant to ignite the mind and the heart toward discovery. Faith demands that you get up and go to the other side. Real faith drives the engine of human curiosity. Real faith will never be found idling. It can't do it. It's got to move. And we've been studying that. One more uh, verse before we dive in is Hebrews 11 verse 3. By faith we understand. A lot of people would view this as a contradictory statement. You cannot put faith and understand in the same sentence. According to God you can and you must. By faith we understand what? That the worlds were framed by the word of God. Any of you in construction? Any of you in engineering, architecture, design? This is a true statement right there. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed, and this is always the case, by. That's the qualifier. How can something come into existence? How can you frame anything? How can you have anything come from uh, parts, bits, or pieces, or in God's case, nothing, and it becomes something. There's only one way, by the word of God. The word, think of this, the word, the, uh, the transmission of information, the logos of God. Information is the first thing by which you can build a house, a car, clothing. It, there's got to be information first before anything becomes tangible. There's a, there's a blueprint to everything God says, and I love that. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are invisible. Absolutely remarkable. Things that we see in this world. There's a whole spirit realm behind it. By the way, that world, word, worlds, eon, in Greek, it means this. Look at this. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed. Look at this word. Little word, big meaning. The enduring of time, the word means. Matter, energy, logos, that's information. The beginning of ancient times. The beginning of the property of time. Time being a physical element to a physical universe. Beyond all the eons of time, how far back does all of this go? People speculate. We don't know for sure. We have the biblical record and we can come within thousands and thousands of years. And then there are scientists who say it's billions and billions. By the way, I love this part. You've got the astrophysicist arguing with the paleontologist and the geologist. They can never come to an agreement on how old anything is because sometimes some scientists place the earth older than the universe. Did you know that? And these guys, God bless them. But they're ramming heads all the time because their science being interpreted causes a big collision because they're not understanding. They don't understand this, that we can't understand everything. You understand that? 
Does that humble you? See, I don't like that. Tough. Get used to it. The older you get, the more you realize, man, I thought I was smart when I was 21. As you get older, you, get, you do get smarter as you get older because you get wiser. And as you get wiser, you realize, man, I'm getting dumber. I thought I knew how that worked. It's absolutely remarkable. The foundation of our Christian experience is having a biblically based faith. And do not assume that you possess this faith. Assumptions can leave you dead, both physically and spiritually. Don't assume you have faith. John chapter 8, verse 30, the Bible says, Jesus spoke these words. Many believed in him. Then he said to the Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's faith. Active, tangible, powerful, on the move. We saw these, church, and we'll wrap it up tonight. In this four-part series, we've seen that faith thinks about the future. We have seen that faith acts into the future. Faith is always, always thinking and acting. And thirdly, faith moves based on the future. Fourth, we saw that faith plans for the future. It takes a lot of faith to plan for the future. And young people today need this kind of faith to trust God and get up and make a plan. Listen, without a plan, your, your life's going to be squandered. Young people, have a plan. Have a plan. Have a vision. Have a pursuit. Kids, I, I, the, the kids today, I don't get it. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm the dinosaur. I should maybe check to see if I have scales or something. But when I hear young people say, I'm not going to buy a car. By the way, if you're in the auto industry or the housing industry, people should be in a panic right about now. The next generation coming up, they don't want to own a car and they don't want to own a home. So I ask them, how are you going to get around? And they look at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> Uber? That's their answer. I'm just going to Uber all my life. And then what about a house? <laughs> Hello, my parents. <laughs> I don't know, man. If that's the view of your kid, I, I would have somebody test your food at night before you eat it. <laughs> the fifth thing we saw is that faith rests upon the future. We can actually rest as believers upon the future because our God has got our future in his hands. And then we pick it up where, now where we left off last time. It's this, is that faith endures looking to the future. We can put up with all kinds of things looking to the future. Ultimately, as a Christian, we rejoice because of this. No matter what goes on in this life and no matter how many black eyes we get, we've read the back of the book and it ends very well for us. We win in the end. And I love that. We can endure anything because the future is in our sights. Verse 17 tells us, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Imagine that. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This is the only reference of an earthly father and an earthly son because that applies to God the Father and God the Son. Abraham and Isaac lived out biblical truth. The only begotten Son, this is not a grammatical error, this is not some kind of a, uh, apostolic exaggeration, it's very deliberate, and that word begotten, we want to look at it, we may have touched on it last time, I don't remember, but monos is that word, and it means, it's, it's a meaning of uh, singularly one, exclusively the one and only one. By the way, that's our theme, on, this is where it comes from, our theme of the entire series, right here. Jesus Christ is the one and only one. And that's what that word means. Listen, everybody, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the one and only one. Isaac was an earthly born son, but he was living out, as Abraham did, Bible prophecy. Thousands of years ago, 2,000 years before Christ, 
Abraham and Isaac lived out what God would do with his son 2,000 years ago. So 2,000 years before Christ, Abraham was going through this experience with his son Isaac. And then 2,000 years back, we look at God the Father doing this with his son on the exact same mountain, by the way. We've also talked at great lengths about that. There is no other, that word means, only begotten. And genus, meaning to be sent, only begotten, meaning to be sent, the presented one, gifted, provided. The word demands that there are no others able to rival, nor replace, nor stand in the place of. And we're talking about Jesus Christ of the Bible. This is the God of the Bible. This is Christ of the Bible. And when we know this, we can endure anything in this world. What's coming? Listen, what this world has in its bag of... of uh, weaponry of this world being racked with sin and evil and violence and mayhem, it's coming at you like a bulldozer. And it might even run over some of us. We have no guarantee. I've got to be in LA tomorrow night. I'm, I'm not happy about that. I saw a tragic thing, maybe you did as well, where a family was visiting from New Zealand on vacation, you saw that. And um, the mother was uh, run over, killed by criminals who were escaping the scene. Come to America and get murdered. But we live in a murderous world. We live in a poisoned world. And that can consume you unless you have faith in Christ. It eats you up without trusting God. And listen, trusting God will make all the difference in the world and he can save your life and rescue you from all evil that this world can throw your way. But this is a powerful statement because Jesus Christ, as we've have often said on Wednesdays and Sundays and whenever, wherever, is that the entire Bible features the Lord Jesus Christ. It features the nation of Israel. We saw that the other day. And uh, Jesus, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. But when it says begotten, this is unique because, friends, listen, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know where you've all come from and I don't know what your backgrounds are, so it's possible I may say a few things here that is going to like ruffle you, but I'm going to ask you to think about why are you being ruffled. When I say begotten, it means that he's the one and only and that if you don't have this Jesus, if you have a different Jesus, you're lost. He said, well, how can you say that? I'm just repeating Bible. And I'm not asking you to join this church. You say, oh, there's your motive. You're going to have us join the church. You can't join this church. We don't have a membership. You just show up. So we don't have any motive except for you to meet God Almighty. And the bottom line is this. You better have the right Jesus because there's a lot of Jesuses out there. So many. And so in the year 132 AD, the Nicene Creed was proclaimed so as to make it clear that Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the Bible was in fact God. You know, they came to that conclusion in 325 because there were so many cults that were saying, this Jesus that you Christians are worshiping, he's not God. You know, that, that attack is not new. And so the church at Nicene and their creed that they assembled was to defend the very uh, deity of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to look at this, uh, this, this quote. It's, it's amazing. They came to this conclusion based on the Old Testament and what New Testament they had, which, by the way, they had the New Testament. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. 
He suffered, and on the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. He shall come to judge both the quick and the dead. The quick means living. The living and the dead, and in the Holy Spirit. The statement. Of course, it goes on much more. But that's the statement. Is this the Jesus you would say, yes, that's him. I agree with that. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10 says this. But, but as it is written, eye is not seen, I love this, nor ear heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And that's a close quote lifted from the Old Testament. But if you stop there, if you don't read verse 10, you'll just think that there's so much that you and I cannot entertain regarding our future. But friends, check out verse 10. What does it start with? What's the word? Say it loud on the count of three. One, two, three. But God has revealed them to us. How has God revealed things to us that cannot be thought of, seen, or entered into the mind of man? What? Is this possible? The Bible says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. You know what that means? It means that you and I can actually unplug from this world and get alone with God and read his word and sit and be quiet. Can you imagine that? What if we all, what if every believer in America did that one day? We actually, listen, seriously, we take days off to go snow skiing or water skiing or surfing or whatever we do, do we not? We take one day off to do a family event or we take one day off to whatever, right? We do this, one day. What if we took one day to all get away from each other and get alone? Lisa and I have a friend. She's a prayer intercessor. And we've known her for decades, and this is what she does. About every so often, maybe three or four or five times a year, she checks into a hotel. She never leaves. Three days, three nights, and prays. Three days, three nights. No room service, no leave the room, no nothing gets on her face and seeks God for whatever God has laid on her heart. And um, I'm not saying you have to do that. It would be wonderful if, if you could. I don't know if I could do that. I might drive myself nuts. <laughs> but God says, you seek me and I will show you and tell you secrets. I will tell you and I will show things on the silver screen, as it were, of your mind. I will reveal myself to you. And I'll, listen, I know this for a fact. I know this. Are you listening? Yes. Struggling with depression? You got a, it's a, you, listen, you got a problem, child? You got things going on in your life? Encourage that child of yours and or you do this yourself. Get alone with God and seek him. Watch what he does. There is not an army that can stop you. There will not be anything that can derail you. When you put God up front like that, and you're alone with him? Well, you know what? Christianity come, comes alive. And you're going to find depression fleeting. How many times today doctors will tell you, your kid has this? I'm sick of it. I'm not knocking medicine but I'm not sure if all doctors have studied medicine. Take your kid and in five minutes, they say, a a ADHD, ADD, LMNOP, here's a pill. Notice, it's, it's, never, it's never, have him work out for three hours. He's a boy for crying out loud. I want him to sweat like a pig. I want him to sweat until he stinks. When's the last time a kid sweat till he stunk? No, no, I'm serious. Did you know that Dr. A.E. Wilder Smith in England, he was one of the head research physicians for the European Union? Do you know what they did regarding people who were, I'm, I have got to get done with this message tonight. <laughs> do, you know what, do you know what he did with soldiers who were in the military who were addicted to drugs? 
Instead of throwing them out of the military, they put them in his care. Do you know what he did? He created, he had seven doctorates, ladies and gentlemen. He wound up figuring out that if these guys drank pure water and water only, and they worked manual labor eight to 10 hours a day, their, what's the t- detox? What is the thing where you, you go through the um, withdrawals? The withdrawals were, you can read about it, the withdrawals were radically shortened, they sweat the poisons out, and they drank and eliminated so much of the poisons, and their sweat, they literally uh, chemically recorded their sweat, and their sweat would go from toxic, as their bloodstream and bodies became more purged and clean, they, they didn't have withdrawals, and their sweat began to emanate the pher- uh, pheromones that, that we're supposed to. But we have a culture today that's not allowed to sweat. You can't sweat. Do they have PE in, in school? Does everybody have to go through physical education in school anymore? Do they sweat? No? Not sure? How did I get on this topic? I... <laughs> Moral of the story, make sure your kids are, oh, God's word will heal you. God's word will heal you. That's it. You got to, you got to sweat. Just like sweating out the poisons, you get along with God and the poisons of the soul, God will extract out. And listen, you can't take a pill for that. It won't work. A pill will only mask it. You're still going to have to face it. But God. He'll do his miracle. And don't tell me he can't because he did in my life. So if he did it to one bozo like me, he can do it to great people like you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son. There you go. Sounds like Abraham and Isaac, yeah? Into the world that we might live through him. I like that. I like that because, listen, without Jesus, I don't like me. (laughs) <laughs> but with them, it's like, let's do this. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son or his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the atonement for our sins. Jesus, oh, this is truth that will wash your soul. 2 Corinthians 5 Verse 6 tells us, so we are always confident, look at this, knowing that while we are at home in the body, that is on this earth, living right now, if that's true, which it is, we're absent from the Lord, we're waiting to go see him, his spirit surrounds us, but this is talking about a time when we will see him face to face, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body, did you know that? The Christian is more pleased to be absent from his body than to be present in this world. Boy, are we being misled in this day and age. We think that the Christian passing on into glory is such a sad day. We need to understand. And so to be present with the Lord, verse 9, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Tremendous statement. Great power. Titus 3, verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. What's his name? Jesus Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, verse 7. I know uh, there's a lot of verses. Just just wait. I have about uh, 51. I have about, I'm not joking. I have 51. And I got to do it fast. (laughs) Philippians 2, verse 7 says, But he made him, that's the Father made him, Jesus Christ, of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. That means Jesus came to this world as the slave to the Father's will. That's how we're supposed to live. And coming in the likeness of men. That's a statement of his deity. Did you know that? 
Jesus Christ came in the likeness of men, mankind. And immediately, I don't know, but immediately I thought of this. My mind automatically goes to John 3.16 on that one. You, you know it. I don't even have to read it, but I'll read John chapter 1. In the beginning, that is of the physical universe, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. I love that. Do you know this Jesus? Or do you have a different Jesus? The cults have a different Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, John says, the only begotten of, there it is, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Only begotten of the Father. Is the Father going to beget another? No. So, Judaism. Remember this now. Judaism is created by man. Judaism rejects the fact that God has an only begotten son. Did you know this? You do know this. My Jewish friends reject that Jesus Christ is God the son. They, they just reject it. I love them. They love me. But we have an absolute different view of the Old Testament scriptures completely. When I read the Old Testament, it's so obvious to me that God has a son. Old Testament. They don't see it that way. Judaism. Islam rejects the fact that God has an only begotten son. Did you know that? Islam declares it. I told you before, all around the Dome of the Rock Mosque in Arabic, it says God does not have a son and God cannot be born. That's a slam on Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. Buddhism rejects that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son. And that's true for Hinduism. Jehovah Witnesses, listen, reject the fact that God has an only begotten son. Did you know that? You, all of us know a Jehovah Witness or two. And it's sad because they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses say God has a son. That's the witness of Jehovah. He has a son. Mormonism, this is a fun one. Mormonism rejects the fact that God has an only begotten son. Did you know that? Mormonism believes and teaches that any man can be a God. There can be millions of sons of God. Mormonism teaches that Adam is the God of the Bible. Well, that's not true. Now, don't get all upset. I love all these people that I just mentioned, what, what team they're on. I don't love their team. I love them as individuals. And I've talked to them at length. But you know what? If Abraham walked in the room right now after hearing what I just said, he'd say, what are you all talking about? What is this you're blabbing on about? There's only one God. And uh, I met him. Did you know that? Not only did Abraham meet the Lord in the flesh, which is known as a theophanies, but later Jesus comes along and says, Abraham saw my day. Abraham had been dead over a thousand years. Two thousand years before Christ was ever born. Number seven. Faith speaks hope into the future. Verse 18, faith speaks hope. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. What a remarkable truth that is. You can read Genesis 17 and Genesis 21 for more of that. But faith speaks hope. And I want to give you some hope right now. Joshua 1.9 have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Psalm 33, verse 11. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Are you hearing this or are you hearing this? This is what you take home. You, you go home, you, you, listen, tonight when you tuck your kids into bed, you say, listen to what I learned tonight. 
Tell them. Tell them this. Did you know that Lamentations 3.26 says, It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord? Job 23, verse 13, but he is unique. And who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. What awesome God he is. Isaiah 55, verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm grateful for that. (laughs) Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. The God of the Bible. I'm going to ask you to answer this question either in your head or out loud, but question, who was Abraham married to? Sarah. That's simple. Question number two, to whom did God make a promise to provide a son? Abraham and Sarah both, right? They both laughed, by the way. Read the fine print. We always blame Sarah for laughing, but the Bible does say that Abraham laughed also. She got in trouble for it. (laughs) Question. Who was the recipient of an everlasting covenant? Who was the recipient of an everlasting covenant? Answer. All who believe as Abraham believed. Do you believe like Abraham believed? In biblical typology, check this out. We may have a slide for this. I'm not sure. If we do, take a picture of it. Or get the notes. You should always get the notes, by the way. You know the notes are posted, and you can download them. Good. And you can even take notes on top of our notes, which is very fun. Okay, look, this is awesome. Remember, Abraham is living out with Isaac, Bible prophecy. This is is not true about Ishmael. This is not true about Allah. This is not true about any god or gods of any other belief system. Only one. Isaac was prophesied to come. Isaac was prophesied to come by God himself. Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's son, was the promised son. Isaac was a miraculous conception. Isaac was for a divine calling. Isaac willingly laid down his life at his father's invitation. Go read Genesis. Remarkable. Isaac was in agreement with his father, says the Bible, when they went to the sacrifice on Moriah. Isaac carried his own wood to his own sacrifice. Sound familiar? Yes. Isaac didn't say no, nor did he resist his father's plan. Number nine, Isaac was offered up on Mount Moriah, the exact mountain that Jesus was offered up on. Isaac was dead. I love this part. This is my favorite part. Isaac was dead for three days to Abraham. You say, what do you mean by that? When God told Abraham, go and offer up your son and give him, after you kill him, offer him up as a burnt sacrifice. The moment that word came to Abraham's head, until the moment Isaac was offered up and God stopped him from it, go count in the Bible. It says three days. How many days was Isaac dead to Abraham's heart. Three days. Remarkable. And then finally this we end here. Verse 19. Faith takes the impossible into the future. Concluding that God was able to raise him up. So my son Isaac has received all of these promises because I received them. I, Abraham, have been promised all these things by God. So God says, from my life, I'm going to populate the earth. If my only son dies, the only conclusion, friends, listen, this is the first real strong declaration of resurrection in the scripture. Genesis, if my son dies, the only way that God's promised is, this is so amazing to me. The only way this can happen is if my son dies, He's going to have to be resurrected from the dead. I don't have any more sons. He's my only begotten son. I thought, I thought Ishmael was his son. Ishmael was his son, but not through Sarah. That's half the promise, if you can put it that way. That's, and that's being generous. It had to be through Sarah. Remember, God said, Sarah, you're going to have a baby about this time next year. And she said, 
I'm 90 years old. I'm past all that. And God says, nope, you're going to have a baby about this time next year. And she, she thought that was so insane, she left. And what happens? Abraham and Sarah? Wouldn't you, seriously, would you honestly, with all due respect and honor to God, really I'm thinking, because you know, look, God, the things that God does in our lives, we, 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 we rip God off from being so practical in our lives. We complicate things. I would have loved to have had a camera outside Abraham's tent the day or the morning that they had made Isaac. No, seriously, can you imagine? He was 99 years old. She's 90. The tent door opens up. Abraham's got his coffee. He's just... (laughs) He's looking at the sunrise. And he's... God. God, you... What are you... God. You are amazing, God. And Sarah comes up, puts her arm around his shoulder. She's got her cup of coffee and they're standing there. (laughs) You know this happened in some way, shape, or form. And she she had to say, can can you believe this? Is this really going to happen? And then he might have said to her, you know, the rumor is, I've heard from others, that you might feel kind of sick maybe as the months go on. I don't know. Let's see. But he said it, and then something happened last night. (laughs) Cannot be denied something happened. (laughs) What's going to become of this? It's a miracle. (laughs) Just last night was a miracle. (laughs) They were filled with hope. (laughs) They had to be thinking, what kind of God is this? That he would visit us like this. That he would be this generous and kind to us like this. What a God. Abraham, do you remember so long ago when he spoke to you and said, get up and leave Ur of the Chaldees. Stop worshiping these pagan gods and follow me. And I thought you were nuts, Abraham. But I followed you. I'm so glad. By the way, a woman is always glad when she follows a man who submitted to God. End of story on that. That's a fact. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, the Bible says, And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. That's Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. What a great verse. Deuteronomy 9, verse 1 to 3. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into the go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than yourself cities great and fortified up to heaven a people great and tall the descendants of the Anakim that's enough to freak you out these are 9 feet tall people and above Anakim the sons of Anak the Anakim these are the giants whom you know and have whom you've heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you. This is key. As a consuming fire, he will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. And then finally this verse, Mark 16, verse 6 But he, that is the angel, said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where he laid him? But go, tell his disciples. And listen, this is for us. And Peter. (laughs) Here's the punch. That he is going before you into Galilee. He's going before you. Notice how many times it says God's going, going to be before you, go before you. He's ahead. Oh, I'm going to, court to, going to go to court tomorrow. I'm scared to death. He'll go ahead of you. Oh, I've got to go to this interview. I've got to go to this thing. I've got this. He's going to go before you. 
He goes before you. And he says, he'll go into Galilee, and there you will meet him, just as he said. So he said, I thought you were going to give us like 50 verses. Here it is. Get your phone out, if you'd like. I'm going to give them to you here right now. And this is the punchline for tonight. This is where we end. So the, the, the big thing, do we have the QR code on? There it is. Okay, can you get up your phone? Get your, if you don't know how to do this, open your camera. And I want you to hold that up there. And then you're going to see a little yellow or green or something's going to pop up on your screen with your camera open. Like, pretend you're going to take a picture, but don't take a picture. Tap that. And it should lead you to almost 50 verses. Now you've got these, save it by the way, you have 50 verses instantly now in the Bible that prove that Jesus is God. I'm going to end with this background. Those 50 verses, I was at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa where I was born again and discipled and I thank God for that under Chuck Smith and one night, Chuck, Pastor Chuck rarely ever surrendered his pulpit, but one night he surrendered it to a guy by the name of Walter Martin and a guy by the name of William Sentnar. And William Sentnar was the head of the Jehovah Witness Bible and Tract Society in Brooklyn, New York. That's the headquarters for the Watchtower Society. And he was head of all correspondence. And in other words, it was his job to answer all the questions that come in from all around the world. So Walter Martin goes into that location in Brooklyn to witness. Walter Martin was afraid of nothing. If you know, does anybody know who I'm talking about, Dr. Walter Martin? If you don't know, you got to buy his books. They, he might even be on YouTube somewhere. He's, long, long, he's been in glory for a long time. He was as hard as nails unapologetic, in-your-face truth. You got hit with the truth, and then you got up and he hit you again with truth. <laughs> he was merciless because he wanted you to go to heaven. So he walks into the uh, Watchtower Society in New York, in Brooklyn, and he, he goes to the front desk, and he's, I know that, I'm telling you, I know this because William Sentnar, I'm gonna blow it before I tell it, William Sentnar that night, I had a chance to talk to him after service, and he told me what happened to him. This is firsthand. These verses, they come from Walter Martin, who gave them personally in a moment of dialogue. Actually, it was three hours of dialogue, they said. Walter Martin said, You're, you are Jehovah's Witness, aren't you? He said, yes, sir, I am. Kind of like the top one because I'm head of over all the answering of the questions. All right, I have a question for you. Who's this? Who's this in the Bible? And when you now look at your, at your QR code that you just got, the first verse, it's all in the order. So Walter Martin asked the first question, who is this? And William Sentinar said, this is Jehovah God. And Walter Martin said, right on. Next verse, who's this? Well, that again is Jehovah God. I agree. Down the list he goes. At every question, William Sentinar had to say the truth. He knew it. That's Jehovah God. Who's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end? That's Jehovah God. Who's the one who was, who is, who is to come, the Almighty? Well, that's Jehovah God. Answer, answer, answer after answer, Jehovah God. All of the attributes, all of the names, all of the descriptions reserved alone for one God. Who's the Savior and the Redeemer of Israel? Jehovah God. Yes, you're right, Walter Martin would say. You're tracking perfectly. And he carries all of those titles from Old Testament into New. And he crosses the line and says, who's the, uh, the one who is the first and the last? Well, we already read that in Isaiah. It's Jehovah God. Are you sure? I think it's around, you'll see it at around Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. William Sentner said, it's Jehovah God. 
Walter Martin said, right. Well, let me keep reading the verse. I'm the first and the last. Behold, I'm, I died, and now I'm alive forevermore. Who is that? And he says, well, that's not Jehovah God. It's the same verse. The top end of the verse, you said, was Jehovah God. The latter end, you said, it's not. This verse says Jehovah God died. Well, that can't be right. Listen, uh, Walter Martin did this with the New uh, Living Translation, which is the Watchtower's Bible. He didn't use your Bible, your, a Christian Bible. He used the Watchtower Society's Bible. I think now since they've actually changed it since then. He went to Revelation chapter, I think it's 2 verse 8 or 2 verse 4. And it says, I am the, the one who, the, the everlasting one, the eternal one. The, I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Bill Sentnar said they ended their conversation together. William, uh, 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 Walter Martin left, and I forget how long it was, but from that moment on, William Sentinar began to not be able to sleep. He, was, he couldn't think any longer about anything else except what had happened. The man who had all the answers for all the Jehovah Witnesses couldn't answer. Had a horrific internal struggle wound up accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and lost everything in his world. His whole world divorced him. And that man stood there that night on that stage and it was called Dialogue at the Doorstep. And after that, I happened, when I was, work, I was working at Baxter Healthcare, and I had been working at that very moment. God went, God went before me, you see, because I was working with a Jehovah Witness on a project. And we were witnessing back and forth to each other. That night was a miraculous night. I didn't, we didn't know it was coming. He pulls out a handwritten reference of all these verses I just gave you. It's very personal for me but you just scanned. I know that doesn't look very personal. <laughs> he handed it to me. And he said, you, you go give that young man this. The Jesus Christ of the Bible is the eternal son of God. Yes. He is the one and only. And if you don't know him as such, you need to know him now. This truth has just come to you, and it's not my truth. Thank God. It's his truth alone. And Jesus alone saves. And you must, you must make a decision for him. I'm going to ask you right now, we haven't done this in a long time, I asked the worship band to come on out, and I, I do want to do this uh, and, and have you guys participate in the festivities outside, so I'm not going to play around tonight. We're going to ask you right now, if you have never understood Jesus to be this God of the scripture and that he alone is your salvation, if you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm going to make this one request if God is speaking to you, get up and run forward now. We're going to pray for you, and you're going to receive a new life because, listen, he died on the cross for your sins, and you've been playing around with religion, and you've never known him personally. And tonight's your night. If Christ is speaking to you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, make a decision for Jesus tonight by recognizing him publicly. I'm not going to put a microphone in your face. I'm not going to ask you to turn around and face the people. I'm going to ask you just to come forward and I'll just pray over you. But if Jesus hung on the cross, torn open and stripped for your sins to be forgiven, then it's incumbent upon you and it's required of you to say, yes, Lord, thank you for dying for my sins 
and I accept your forgiveness and I accept your eternal life, your gift. I come to you as the one and only. Come right now. I'm not going to ask again. You come and make your way. So those of you who have come, let's pray. Repeat this prayer after me. Just mean it. God knows your heart. Are you ready? Dear Lord Jesus, I want to become a new person. I want my life washed and made new. I'm asking you, Father, tonight to put your Holy Spirit in my life, to lead me and to guide me from this time forward because I confess Jesus Christ, my crucified Savior, and my resurrected Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.